everyone. Welcome to lesson nine. The topic is sin. And we have two memory verses in this lesson. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Uh, this is uh, kind of a bummer of a topic, uh, but as we learn from Romans 6.23, it's got an amazing uh, uh, solution. God responds in an amazing way. Uh, so let's look at, look at, at so let's look at this. <laughs> uh, let's start with the core truth. And that first phrase, the question, what severed the relationship between God and humanity continues. Just that word severed, that's just such a, a picture. Uh, it's not, you know, what scarred or what marred the relationship, but severed. Just this, this picture of being torn apart and um, like permanently separated. I mean, that's what we did. So what did that? And then I highlighted a few phrases uh, in the definition. I love the phrase perfect harmony. Right? Though we were created in the image of God and therefore in perfect harmony with him. And uh, for me, that just communicated uh, the idea of something beautiful that we were in sync with God and what he wanted for us. But then our response, uh, willfully disobeyed. Willfully disobeyed. In essence, you know, we, we just thought we knew better. Right? We're going our own way because we know better. Uh, and then the phrase, distrusted his goodness. Like, you know, that's too good to be true. This is what God's offering me, but... I don't know if I can trust him. Therefore, uh, because I think I know better, I'm going to go my own way. Uh, so I really liked that that picture. Uh, so let's look at the memory verse study guide, see what we could learn. And I want to highlight a few questions. The first is number four. It asks, how is sin defined? Is the glory of God a fair standard to be measured by? Uh, so I said sin is our willful disobedience to God and his ways in the way that we think, we speak, or we act. And I said, yeah, it's fair. Uh, it's God's world. We are his creation, so we can't pollute his presence with sin. Uh, this reminds me uh, of uh, the verse, let me look this up. I think it's Psalm 115, yeah, yeah, Psalm 115.3, the psalmist says, Our God is in heaven. He does whatever pleases him. A Bible teacher from years ago, J. Vernon McGee, had an amazing quote in reference to this verse. Uh, McGee says, Let me remind you that this is God's universe, and he is doing things his way. You may think you have a better way, but you don't have a universe. <laughs> so is God's way uh, fair? Uh, absolutely. It's his, it's his world. Let's look at number eight. What is meant by death? I wrote, death is brokenness and separation on earth. It's destruction of our relationship with God and others, and it leads to final and eternal separation from God. Uh, that's, that's significant. And then number, number nine, uh, how did these verses speak to me this week? I actually found a quote, and I wrote, it reminded me of the extent and power and harm of sin. And I found a quote I want to read uh, from Jerry Bridges in uh, the, his book, Transforming Grace. He says this, Sin, in the final analysis, is rebellion against the sovereign creator, ruler, and judge of the universe. It resists the rightful prerogative of a sovereign ruler to command obedience from his subject. Sin says to an absolutely holy and righteous God that his moral ways, which are a reflection of his own nature, are not worthy of our wholehearted obedience. 
Sin is not only a series of actions, it is also an attitude that ignores the law of God. But it is even more than a rebellious attitude. Sin is a state of heart, a condition of our inmost being. It is a state of corruption, of vileness, yes, even of filthiness in God's sight. So, sin is a little word, just three letters, uh, but it carries enormous weight and enormous consequences. So let's look at the next section, Inductive Bible Study Guide. So in the inductive uh, Bible study, we look at Genesis chapter 3. First question, I love this. What was the serpent's ploy in verse 1? And now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? So I said he tries to get Eve to doubt God's instruction. And he actually twists it. He twists God's instruction. And uh, this came up in in my uh, discussion uh, with my group and one of the guys made a great observation. He said, you know, the instruction was originally given to Adam. We see that in chapter 2, verse 16. Yet the serpent goes to Eve. So a good question is, how well are we making disciples? God spoke to Adam, and it was Adam's uh, role uh, to equip, to educate, uh, to, to lead Eve. So how, how successful was he? You know, did he take that responsibility in, in communicating? Is Eve uh, repeating what she heard from Adam? Uh, or is Eve maybe in, intimidated or threatened by the serpent? Uh, so I, I don't know, uh, but that's just interesting. And you know, how does he distort God's generous words from Genesis 2, 16 and 17? And I wrote, God offered them the fruit of all the trees, except one, just one. But Satan implies that they cannot eat from any tree. So, total uh, distortion. Let's look at question three. What temptation is placed before the woman in verses four and five? <clears throat> I said there's, there's two. Um, first, to doubt God's word. Right? He says, you will not certainly die. So doubt God's word and tempts, um, uh, tempts her to be like God, that she can know good and evil. So doubt God's word, be like God. Uh, number four, from observing the serpent's strategy, how would you define sin? I wrote, to twist or distort God's words and instructions and intentions so that I do what I want. You know, when you're seeking uh, counsel, and you've got a thought, you've got an idea, maybe someone said something to you and you want to follow up. Uh, when we're not really teachable, we're not really willing to do <laughs> what's right, we just keep going to people until we hear what we want to hear. Uh, and that's kind of what we do with, uh, with, with sin. You know, we twist, distort God's words, instructions, uh, so that we can do what we want. Number five, uh, this is good. Uh, how do the consequences of sin affect humankind's relationship with self? I wrote, we become self-conscious. We become ashamed. Uh, with God, I said we fear God, but not in the good way. Right? There's uh, a healthy way to fear God, which, wow, we recognize his, his holiness. And, you know, who are we to come uh, to be in relationship with a, a holy and mighty God, and there's, there's a sense of reverence and honor. Uh, that's a healthy way. But this, we we, we fear God, and it's, we just run, and we, we run um, from Him. Uh, and as a result, we're doing that because we doubt His goodness. Uh, so consequence of sin with humankind, consequence of sin with God. The next section with fellow humans. Well, if you see this, verses 11 to 16. I said we blame others and we seek to dominate others or control uh, us uh, in, in, in relationships, specifically in this context, in a marriage. 
and then with creation verses 17 and 19 that we'll have to toil with creation and sweat to produce fruit and then um, question seven what verse or verses have particularly impacted you and I just noted uh, chapter 3 verse 9 but the Lord called to the man where are you and I said you know what God pursues us even when we rebel against him here's God pursuing man man turned his his back uh, mankind a man and woman turned their their backs on God yet God here's God saying where are you he's, he's pursuing us that, that's a that's a big deal that's a big deal in the reading it's that second uh, paragraph the the last sentence the Bible places the problems for the ills of humanity not on a societal flaw but here it is in a character defect in the heart of every individual we're not <laughs> born good uh, Initially, we were. We, we, we were born uh, you know, perfect. Uh, but then sin has taken over, and now everyone who is born uh, is born with a character defect. And you know, even innocent children, as they age, as they grow, uh, quickly demonstrate that. Right? None of us is perfect, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Uh, and the next section under the source of the problem. Uh, second paragraph, God has given these humans a risky gift, freedom of choice. I like this. Without the ability to choose, humans would be robots. Without choice, there is no love. Without freedom, love is a pre-programmed response. Uh, freedom of choice is a gift. Freedom of choice is a blessing. God invites us to be in relationship with him. He doesn't demand it or control it. Uh, so this is an, an incredible um, blessing. But look at this next section, the, to distrust the goodness of God. The serpent's first strategy is to cause the woman to question whether God is for her. Uh, a little later it says, Satan's tactic is to begin to sow doubt to cause the woman to question whether God is too uh, restricted. A couple paragraphs down, it says, unrestricted freedom leads only to destruction. And then he illustrates, you know, saying, hey, if we had unrestricted freedom with when driving a car, yeah, we wouldn't have to stop at lights, we can go in any lane we want, whenever we want. And that's not healthy. That would uh, uh, create confusion, would create chaos, and would create destruction. Uh, so that last sentence in that section says, our best interest is always freedom within limits, within defined boundaries. And uh, we see that in relationships. Healthy relationships have freedom. There's not jealousy or intimidation. There's freedom. Um, but without those swim lanes or, or boundaries, you know, we can hurt one another and, and hurt ourselves. Um, so there is uh, freedom. Uh, what our best interest is to have freedom within limits, within defined boundaries. Um, Adam and Eve... Uh, you know, we're told they could eat the fruit of any tree except one. <laughs> there was a limit, but there was so much freedom in what they uh, could have chosen. That last section uh, titled Rebel Against God's Authority, uh, I just want to read you the, the quote by John Stott at the, at the very end. Uh, this is a powerful quote. The essence of sin is man substituting himself for God, while the essence of salvation is God substituting himself for, for man. That's, that's amazing, isn't it? Man asserts himself against God and puts himself where only God deserves to be. God sacrifices himself for man and puts himself where only man deserves to be. Man claims prerogatives which 
belong to God alone, and God accepts penalties which belong to man alone. Wow. God is good. This does not make sense why God would do this. But that's Romans 6, 23. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Um, what, a, what a gift. And then the reading study guide, I just want to highlight a few of these. Uh, number one, what are some of the ways people attempt to de deflect personal responsibility for sin? Uh, I said we blame others. We believe it's not our fault. We believe God is overbearing. Uh, one of the guys in my group um, said, uh, we point the finger, not the thumb. <laughs> right? It's your fault rather than, you know, it, it's my bad. I did something that's wrong. Uh, number two, what's the biblical diagnosis as to why something is drastically wrong? And it's that there's a character defect in the heart of every person. Uh, the prophet Jeremiah reveals this. Chapter 17, verse 9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? Number three, how does the serpent sow seeds of doubt in the woman? He twists and distorts God's words, questions the goodness of God. And then uh, the la or number seven, number seven, in what ways do you see people acting as if they were God? Uh, I said people believe they're above the law. They believe the law doesn't apply to them. Yeah. Drive a speed limit, yeah, it's good for them. Um, do my taxes fairly, yeah, it's good for them, but you know, everybody doesn't know what uh, I, I deserve. You know, we can just justify just about anything. And then the next uh, follow-up question in number seven, where do you see that tendency in yourself? And I said, anytime I sin, I am choosing my own way. I said, when I ignore the needs of others in order to do what I want, <laughs> um, I see that tendency. Or when I leave work for others to do because I don't want to do it, I see that tendency. Uh, so uh, I hope you have a great uh, discussion in this this lesson. Uh, again, in some ways, it's it's kind of a downer, it's a bummer, but uh, it's totally redemptive. Uh, the whole idea of substitutionary death, I mean, that's just powerful. What we deserve, God took uh, for us. Uh, so enjoy this. Uh, may you be reminded of the goodness of God and the holiness of God. May we be inspired to uh, follow Jesus in, in obedience with enthusiasm uh, by his strength and uh, by the, the Holy Spirit. Uh, so have an amazing group.